now we just gotta see him in action. I'll have access to the galaxy map. That's great. Presley? Apparently he doesn't want to talk to me. That's fine. <laughs> random Marine salutes me. That's cool. Thank you for saluting me, Random Marine. Alright. Just looking around. Here's the mess. Anything you need, Commander? Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? I've wasted enough of your time for now, Commander. We'll have time for personal debriefings later. What's your opinion on the last mission? I don't see how we could have done things any better. At least not without getting to Eden Prime sooner. And we were on the scene faster than any other Alliance ship could have been. We'll talk another time, Lieutenant. Commander? Very good, Lieutenant. Okay. Shepard's Locker. Oh, there's guns in here. Cool. Sleeper pod. Oh, right. Must be for, like, you know, cryo sleep. For, like, long trips and such. Makes sense. Guess my mini gel was full. Doctor? Yes, Commander? Is there something you need? How did you end up serving on an Alliance ship? I enlisted right out of med school. Earth always seemed boring to me. Too safe. Too secure. I figured the colonies were teeming with exotic adventure. I wanted to travel the stars, tending the wounds I think we already of had this soldiers discussion with piercing with eyes and sensitive souls. <laughs> Turns out military life is... But humanity needs the Alliance if we want to keep expanding through the Traverse. And the Alliance always needs good doctors. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Square skips through conversations. Okay. I was going to say, we've already had that discussion with her. Last time we were on the ship. Alright. Well, let's take the elevator. Looks like I have some people down here to talk to. Hey, Commander. Looking for some extra supplies before you head out? What have you got? Whatever you want. Armor, weapons, mods. It's not standard Alliance issue, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, as long as you don't mind paying for it. Why should I pay you for my weapons and armor? <laughs> right? That stuff doesn't come from the Alliance. I have to purchase it myself, and it's not cheap. Hell, the licenses alone have set me back more than I'd like. But no licenses, no goods. Without the goods, I'm out of a job. Let's see what you've got. You bet, Commander. Alright. Can't afford anything. Yeah, I can't afford anything anyway. Garrus? Thanks for bringing me on board, Commander. I knew working with a Spectre would be better than life at CSEC. Have you worked with a Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. At CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. For the most part, the rules are there for a reason. Maybe. But sometimes it feels like the rules are only there to stop me from doing my work. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. CSEC's handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. 
I hope you made the right choice. I'd hate for you to regret it later. Well, that's sort of why I teamed up with you. It's a chance for me to get off the Citadel, see how things are done outside CSEC. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without CSEC headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. If getting the job done means endangering innocent people, then no. We get the job done right, not bad. Got it? I wasn't trying to. I understand, Commander. I think I might have pissed him off. Nice ship you've got, Shepard. It is, isn't it? What can it? I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. <laughs> Don't be an ass! You Krogan lived for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. I heard about that. You know, they almost did the same to us. It's not the same. It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? Uh... An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? Okay, didn't know about that. I don't expect you to understand, but don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. I was just making conversation. I wasn't trying to upset you. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected. Every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. So long, Rex. Shepard. Oh, okay. I can change their gear here at these lockers. Interesting. Commander? What's your opinion on the last mission? Kinda wish you'd got there sooner, Commander. No offense. I appreciate the rescue. I just wish... You wish we'd been able to save the rest of your unit? Yes, sir. If I had been more alert, we wouldn't have been cut down by an ambush. The Gath are perfect ambushers. They don't move, they don't make noise, they don't even breathe. Sir, they have flashlight heads. I'm not sure <laughs> Do you have a few minutes to talk one-on-one? -on -one? I'm sorry, Commander. I need to get my duty squared away. I wouldn't mind talking more later, though. Dismissed, Chief. Sir. They have flashlight heads. She's right. <laughs> this must be engineering. Yep, engineering. Hey, Commander, you know that quarry in Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. 
Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You've got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth systems. How does it work, exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually, the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running, and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. True. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. So faster than light gives us away, huh? Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. Nice. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on, probably the fastest vessel ever designed. She's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. That helps. Where else have you served, Adams? If you name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo, only a cruiser. She was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype. Cutting-edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tugship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. <sighs> Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, 
Incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. That's your government? The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials. In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. <laughs> really? It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Oh, tell me more. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. So you thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So, the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in a group, the smarter they are. So there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But, when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. What made them rebel? As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. What did you do? It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. You can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died huh. at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Vale. 
Now we drift through space, exile searching for a way to reclaim ah. what was once ours. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach Maturin, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. Which explains the By the, the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. I want to talk about something else. Like what? I think we're done here. I should go. See you later. A lot of XP from her. Well, the Quarian story seems to parallel that of Battlestar Galactica, almost to a T. You know, creating a VI that rebels on them and forces them out of their homeworld. Yeah. Where's the elevator control? Yes, I would like to activate the elevator. I need to go back up to the CIC. Thank you. Well, I don't need to, but I want to. Actually, I kind of need to. I think I've talked to everybody down here. This is a very slow elevator. <laughs> Where's this go? All right. Let's see, I see. I just got experience for some reason. Okay. They're just gonna hand it to me, I'm cool with that. <laughs>